The Adjusting and Closing Process, Chapter 3, Wild, 6th Edition. Using the chapter example, we will walk through the process of adjusting the books to recognize all revenue and expenses as of the financial statement date, as well as the closing process necessary to prepare the books for the next accounting cycle. In Chapter 2, we ended at the unadjusted trial balance, where we had all of the accounts with their relative debited and credit balances at the end of the journal entry process. The journal entries are related to transactions with outside or external parties. Adjusting journal entries, on the other hand, are internal journal entries that an experienced accountant knows needs to be made as a result of external transactions as well as transactions that are taking place within the company. So let's look at the types of transactions we're talking about. We're talking about six types of transactions, six journal entries for this chapter. Prepaid insurance. The experienced accountant knows that when prepaid insurance is booked, that that insurance will be used up as the business earns money and as the individual months pass by. So as time passes, a certain amount of this insurance is going to expire. Next, when we record the the purchase of supplies, the experienced bookkeeper or accountant also knows that the supplies need to be counted in order to be able to determine how much was used in order to produce the income for this month. So they have to figure out by counting the supplies how much supplies have been used during the month. Next, when we purchase equipment, we have to take into consideration depreciation. So accumulated depreciation will have to be taken into consideration as well as depreciation expense. Depreciation is taking the value of equipment and pro rata or on an equal basis each month booking that expense against the revenues because the equipment was purchased in order for, to help the company earn revenues. So that cost has to be equitably taken into income as, a, and as an expense, taken against revenue as an expense. Next, we'll have to look at unearned revenue because only internally will the company know how much of this unearned revenue they have actually earned through working on this client's um, project throughout the month. Next, well, they, the company will look at what employees have, uh, well the fact that employees have earned salaries since the last pay date. So we'll have to look at how much have employees have earned since the last pay date and the end of the month. Additionally, the company will also look at any work that it is not yet completed and not yet billed, but has substantially worked on throughout the month in order to recognize the revenue associated with it and the accounts receivable that would be as a result of that. So now I've sort of described all of these. You may want to pause and read through them, but I'll read through them in more detail as we work through the adjusting journal entries necessary to recognize all expenses and revenue before the financial statement date. So prepaid insurance represented three months of 24 months of insurance. One month has passed at month end, therefore 2400 divided by 24 months means $100 per month has to be recognized as insurance expense. So the company has used up a portion of the insurance and so this insurance expense because it was help used to help generate the revenue and also the fact that prepaid insurance has gone down it's going to be credited in the amount of one hundred dollars and reduce the balance in prepaid insurance whenever you're preparing an adjusting journal entry you will always have an income statement account and a balance sheet account involved next let's look at the supplies the supply account at month end reveals that $8,670 worth of supplies have not been used at month end. Therefore, the total that was purchased during the month, $9,720, we are going to subtract from that the amount that are still on hand, $8,670, 
which means that the company must have used $1,050 in supplies during the month when it was preparing and doing everything that it needed to do in order to generate revenue. So supplies expense would be $1,050. So that's an expense during the month of what they used. And now supplies have gone down. So we're going to credit this asset account we're going to credit it in order to reduce the supplies. Next, let's look at how we calculate depreciation. The equipment salvage value is $8,000 on this piece of equipment. The equipment cost, which was $26,000, minus its salvage values equals the depreciable base, which is what we'll use in order to calculate depreciation. The equipment cost $26,000. The salvage value is $8,000, which means the depreciable base is $18,000, and that represents 48 months. That's the useful life of this equipment was 48 months. So $18,000 divided by 48 equals $375. One month has passed at year end. I mean, at month end. So it's been one month since the last time they prepared financial statements. Well, actually. Actually, the company opened this month, but it's been one month, and so we need to recognize depreciation expense for the month. So depreciation expense is going to be $375. Now we have a new account, accumulated depreciation equipment, $375. So a word about accumulated depreciation. Notice we did not take $375 against the equipment cost. We put it in an account called accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. So on the balance sheet, we will see $26,000 in equipment. And next to it, or right below it, we will see accumulated depreciation equipment. $375. The net of those two will be the book value of the, of the equipment on the financial statement balance sheet. On the balance sheet, that financial statement, we will see the net value of the depreciate, the equipment cost minus the accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation does just what it says it does. It will accumulate depreciation for every month that that piece of equipment is in the company. Next, let's look at unearned revenue. The unearned revenue represents a 60-day contract. Five days have passed at month end. So $3,000 divided by 60 days means that the contract earns $50 per day as long as they're working on it, and they have been working on it. So five days have elapsed, and so at month end, they've worked on it for five days. So that means the company has earned $250. So unearned consulting revenue in the amount of $250 will be shown as a debit against unearned consulting revenue because a debit to an a liability account means that unearned consulting revenue has gone down. So this is reducing the liability by $250. Again, we've earned that revenue, so instead of it being unearned, now it's going to be consulting revenue showing that they've earned, and now they'll be able to put this on the income statement showing that they've earned an additional $250 in revenue at month end. Next, we have to look at what the employees have been earning, I mean, earning and what we have by way of a payable to them as a result of them helping us earn income throughout the month. So the employees earn $700 for a, for a 10 day work week. Three days have passed at month end. So $700 divided by 10 days means that the employees earn $70 per day and will have to pay them or have to account for and recognize that three days have been worked at month end, meaning that we owe them $210. And $210 is the salary expense associated with earning income at month end that we haven't yet recognized. So the salary expense as a debit will increase as $210. And the salary payable will also increase $210. Now, when we finally do pay them in the following month for their salary and on the regular payday, we'll have to take into consideration the salary payable when we pay them, when we do the journal entry. Next, the company is working on a job not completed and not billed, but has worked for 20 days on this contract at month end. 
So it's not completed, so they haven't built the company, but they get to recognize the fact that they have earned this revenue. So they're paid $90 per day. They worked on it for 20 days, so they've earned an additional $1,800 in revenue. And so since they have not been paid, they get to recognize an account receivable, a receivable balance from this client that they've been working for, and also the fact that they've earned additional consulting revenue. Now let's look at how these adjusting journal entries interface with the general ledger. So our insurance expense is debited because it's gone up. Our prepaid insurance is being credited because the prepaid has gone down. So in other words, at the month end, if they had decided to go with a different insurance carrier, the insurance company would only pay them back 2300 because they've used up a month of insurance company. So therefore, they have to properly value the insurance on, on their prepaid insurance on their balance sheet. Next, supplies expense. Supplies expense has gone up by $1,050. And also we see that supplies, office supplies as an asset has gone down or been credited for $1,050. This means that office supplies is now properly valued on the balance sheet at $8,670, which you'll remember is what they counted to be still in the storeroom for supplies. Again, income statement account balance sheet account. Depreciation expense, equipment, $375. So we're going to recognize it as an adjusting journal entry, depreciation expense associated with the equipment. That's the income statement account. Now we have accumulated depreciation for the equipment. This is the balance sheet account. Again, it's a contra asset account. On the balance sheet, it will be shown right under equipment, showing that the value of the equipment has gone down by $375 as its net book value on the balance sheet. Next, unearned consulting revenue, $250. We're going to debit it, showing that this liability has been decreased because we've earned $250 out of that contract. So now, if the client were to resend the contract, that we would only have to pay them back $2,750. Also, as a result of doing the work, we've earned $250. So under consulting revenue as an adjusting journal entry, we will increase revenue $250. Salary expense, salary payable. We will show that we have a salary payable as a result of the three additional days since the last paydays that employees have been working to help us generate this revenue. And we'll have to show that in addition to the $1,400 balance as, as the salary expense, we have an additional salary expense of $210. This is the income statement account, salary payable is the balance sheet account. Next, accounts receivable for $1,800 for the, for the um, revenue earned on the consulting contract that we've been working on, but we haven't yet billed the client and we haven't received the cash. So the adjusting journal entry will be to increase accounts receivable. That will be the balance sheet account. The income statement account is consulting revenue. So now as a result of this adjusting journal entry, our consulting revenue has gone up to $7,850. Now let's look at this as the unadjusted trial balance interfaces with the general ledger and the adjusted trial balance. Well, we can see that cash is the same, and we can see as a result of doing our journal entries that prepaid insurance was 2400 but now it's 2300 Insurance expense, we had no insurance expense, and now we do have insurance expense in the amount of $100. Again, if I'm moving too quickly, pause and play in order to be able to feel comfortable with the amount of transactions that are transpiring. Next, supplies. Supplies started out at 9720 Our balance is now 8670 as a result of the adjusting journal entries. So we can see that our supply account is, is correctly valued and we've now recognized supply expense on the income statement.
Next, accumulated depreciation was not there. Neither was depreciation expense. Again, as, and as an experienced accountant, no one's going to send you a bill for this. You need to know that you have to book these entries as adjusting journal entries. So here we have accumulated depreciation and depreciation expense. And here it is on the adjusted trial balance. The adjusted trial balance is the balance that our trial balance that you would use to prepare the financial statements since all of these adjusting journal entries have brought the financial statements up to date. Next, let's look at the unearned consulting revenue. It's gone down, and so now our consulting revenue has gone up. So we can see that our unearned consulting revenue has gone down, but our consulting revenue has gone up. Next, let's look at our salaries payable. It didn't exist. We did have salary expense, but because of those three additional days, we have to recognize the payable, recognize the additional salary expense. So salary expense has increased as well as our salary payable has increased. Additionally, we didn't have anything accounts receivable because our prior client had paid off their balance, but now we have a new receivable in the amount of $1,800. Our consulting revenue has gone up. So accounts receivable $1,800, consulting revenue has gone up. We can see that our debits equal our credits, and we can see if we look through this, these all represent normal account balances. Again, normal account balances mean whether or not debits increase the account or credits increase the account. So for assets, dividends, and expenses, the normal balance is a debit balance. For liabilities, common stock, and revenue, the normal balance is a credit account. Now we can look at our adjusted trial balance. That's where we ended and we would have prepared financial statements. So as a result of preparing the financial statements, now we're ready to close the books and set the books up for the next accounting period. Remember how we talked about consulting revenue and rental revenue being on the income statement and depreciation expense and all of the other expenses being on the income statement. And we said that the income statement is comprised only of revenue and expenses. But we said that it was like a moving picture and it was prepared as of the month ended, I'm sorry, for the period ended a certain month for the quarter ended or for the year ended. That's because this the income statement only accumulates information for a certain period in time. Therefore, we have to zero it out in order to reset it to accumulate information for upcoming periods. So the closing entries that we're going to be looking at now are entries needed to reset income and expense and dividends to zero. So in addition to the income statement being zero, all the income statement accounts being zeroed out, we will also zero out dividends. And we will look at how we do that looking at the closing entries. The first closing entry, there are always four closing entries. The first one is to debit all of the revenue. We know that revenue accounts are typically credit based. So if we debit them, we're going to zero them out. Now we will use a new account for the first time called the income summary account. It is used just in the closing process and just for the income statement accounts in order to facilitate the closing process. Additionally, these will all get booked eventually to retained earnings, but we don't want a lot of miscellaneous transactions and retained earnings sort of gumming up the works and making it unclear as to what's transpiring in retained earnings. So they came up with the convention of using the income summary to book these entries. Next, we'll use the income summary account again. And what we're doing in this uh, transaction, this journal entry, this closing entry, is we are going to credit all of the expenses. So crediting all of the expenses will zero them out. The total of all of those credits are going to be a debit to the income summary account. So first we zero out or debit all of the revenues. Secondly, we credit all of the expenses. The third step is to take the income summary and zero it out. And when we look at the T accounts, that will be more obvious that there's a credit balance of $3,785 in the income summary. 
And right now, because this is a new company, we don't have anything in retained earnings, but we are going to close out the income summary account, which is used for the revenue and expense accounts. We're going to close it out to retained earnings. So the amount that's going to be recredited to retained earnings is $3,785, which if we look at it is really going to be net income because if you look at it, you're taking all of the revenue minus all of the expenses, if you prepared an income statement, you would see that net income was $3,785. Next, let's look at closing out the dividends account. Again, we said that the dividends are a temporary account. It's uh, in the statement of retained earnings, and um, all of those accounts are as of the month ended or as of the quarter end. I'm sorry, forgive me. For the month ended or for the quarter ended or for the year ended. So it is one of the um, statements that accumulates information for a certain time period, and so we're going to zero them out. So dividends, we can see here, is normally debit-based. So in order to clear out dividends and zero them out, we're going to um, credit dividends, and then the debit will go to retained earnings. So now let's see how this looks like when we look at the T accounts, and it will be easier for you to understand. Now, on a test and in homework, I would suggest that you do the four steps, the four closing entries that we're looking at. Do those. But I would also always suggest that you go ahead and prepare T accounts so you won't get confused as to what's transpiring. It looks deceptively simple. So here we are debiting consulting revenue, debiting rental revenue, and our ending balance is zero. We're going to use the income summary account and we are going to credit. Our closing entry will be a credit to the income summary account. Next, we are going to credit all of the expenses and the debit will go to income summary. So here's our closing entry for the total of all of the expenses we are crediting, $4,365. And then we can see for rent, salary, utilities, insurance, and supply, as well as depreciation, we are crediting all of those accounts, rendering the ending balance all zeros. So next, we're going to close out the income summary account. At present, there's a balance of $3,785 there. So we're going to close it out to retained earnings. So let's look at that. So the income summary, $3,785, is the closing entry here. Previous to that, we had a credit balance of $3,085. So now, with debiting that, we have an ending balance and income summary of zero. We can see the other part of this closing entry is $3,785 to retained earnings. So now the retained earnings has a credit balance of $3,785. So now, let's look what's going on with dividends. So now we have an additional journal entry, dividends. We are going to be zeroing them out. So the closing entry related to dividends is going to be a credit to dividends. So it had a beginning balance of a debit, a credit of 200. So the ending balance will be zero. So it, as well as everything else related to the income statement, has now been zeroed out. And now retained earnings has a balance of $3,585 as a result of the closing entry to income summary and the closing entry to dividends. So we can see all the ending balances for income, expenses, the income summary, and dividends is zero. And the net effect of all of that has now been booked to retained earnings. So now let's look at a post-closing trial balance. So here we have the adjusted trial balance. We can see the amounts that were originally in the adjusted trial balance and see how all of them look the same because the only thing that was affected in our closing entries were the income statement accounts, which were the revenue, the expenses, as well as the statement of retained earnings account, the dividends. So we can see all of these balances on the post-closing trial balance look like they did on the adjusted trial balance. The only one that's different is retained earnings. So see, retained earnings was zero. As the, un as the adjusted trial balance, and now in the post-closing trial balance, retained earning is $3,585. We can see that there are no balances in dividends, 
revenue, or expenses. So the only thing remaining on the post-closing trial balance are only those accounts which are balance sheet accounts. So only the balance sheet accounts remain on the post-closing trial balance. We can see, using the purple highlight, how all of these have been closed. Again, pause these if I went too quickly and just go through it step by step. And we can see at the end that all of our debits equal all of our credits.